um, very special speaker, so Colin St. John Wilson, which most of you know. Um, Sandy needs very little, if any, in introduction really. Um, he's the architect of the British Library, that uh, most of you know, and many other highly regarded university buildings for over a period of time. Um, Sandy began pra practicing with Leslie Martin um, after working in the LCC Housing Division um, and also has been closely associated with Alto over the la uh, over the many uh, many years and um, so he's written a number of um, articles and books um, on the alternative tradition of uh, modern architecture and um, he, I suppose we could say, responsible, if that's the right word to use, to introduce the qualities and, and, and um, um, importance of um, some of the architects like Leverance, like Alto, um, and the others uh, to, to in this country. Um, and at my student time, I enjoyed reading um, his articles on Leverance, his work on on that, which stays still, still with me, actually. Um, just like to say that there are very important two two important books: the Architectural Reflections, um, which has been reprinted, and also the other tradition of modern architecture, both by Sandy, is available now. So I would advise you to go and get it if you don't already have it. Uh, his presentation today traces the classical relationship of form and purpose and goes back to the 18th century, including other traditions which comes back to the uh, 1930s and Hugo Herring. I'll stop talking now. I really look forward to Sandy's presentation. Thank you. Thanks. No, sir. Um, I, w I want to do three things. Firstly, I want to talk a little bit about um, Herring as a phenomenon, an extraordinary phenomenon in the sort of politics of architectural theory. Secondly, I, I want to examine uh, his, the unique core of his theory and to illustrate it by one project uh, taken through in some detail. Um, I, I was first introduced to Herring in an article that Jodica did in the Architectural Review in 1959. And I've been kind of, kind of sort of haunted by him ever since. And in fact, he's, he's sort of the hero of the, of the earliest of the articles in Architectural Reflections, um, which was written in 1960. Um, when, when I say that he's a phenomenon in the politics of architectural theory, I'm referring to something that Peter Bannum called the zone of silence. Um, P Peter was the first of the sort of second wave of historians about the modern movement. And he observed a number of names, personalities, theses and so on that hadn't found their way into the, um, a, a, the canon of the International Congress of Modern Architecture, as written by Siegfried Gideon. Uh, uh, the, the thing that was extraordinary uh, about um, uh, Harry is that it wasn't that he'd been sort of overlooked. You were referring to Leverens just now, um, who'd been simply overlooked. He, 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 he had been deliberately assassinated uh, by Le Corbusier and Gideon, which makes him remarkable. Incidentally, it shows how dangerous his theory is, because you don't try to assassinate 
someone unless you're frightened of them. Um, this man was one of the major figures in German architecture. He was the chairman of the Ring in Berlin, which was the gathering of virtually all the important architects in Germany in the mid-twenties. He was sharing an office, eyeball to eyeball, a room with Mies van der Rohe, and one would love to hear those conversations, if only they'd been taped. Good God, we would have had a great mouthful. Um, I, I believe that his uh, pr project for the Friedrichstrasse was every bit as powerful as the very, very famous and co continually publicized version by Mies. When the notion of the exhibition of in Stuttgart, the Weissenhof Seidlung, the first attempt to make a sort of public presentation of examples of what the modern move was meant to be, he was working with Mies on that and he proposed to make it into the occasion for setting up an international organization uh, which takes us to 927. And then we get, and can I have the first, first slide, please? And then we get the famous, oh, you've blown my, <laughs> I said one slide only. Take that one off, quick, I haven't got to that. Um, the gathering in La Sarraz in 1928, which was, um, organized by Le Corbusier and Gideon, who got on very well with the lady who owned the place. Uh, there's Corbu, and um, Gideon must be there somewhere. Oh, there he is. Um, and Corbu arrived there with what he called his plan de bataille. He got it all set up that there should be a simple, rational, um, eloquent, um, elegant theory that could be easily put across, which is the language of all of the revolutionaries, so that it can be handed down to the, to the workers in the field. And cutting a long story short, um, this, this guy, um, Hugo Herring, had the audacity to say, you're trying to go too fast. We need, first of all, to find out what is really necessary before you start laying down all these damn rules. And Corbu is absolutely brilliant at laying down elegant French Cartesian rules. The five formal points, the four functions, the seven roots, the three this, the two that, is very logique, no? You know, and all that kind of thing. And this, this guy said, life ain't like that, and people aren't like that. Uh, uh, we need to take it a bit more slowly. And he was dismissed, and now we can have the slide on the right. And here is the cartoon that Corbu put in his letter to Gideon, saying, thank God we got rid of that. Uh, you see he's got a halo, that, that sanctimonious so-and-so, um, with a little joke about a herring and herring and, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> very French, very witty. Um, and he, he was simply wiped off the map. Gropius colluded in this and had him substituted by Breuer. So the, the extraordinary thing is you get this build, build up right up to the, the period when, when, when the Grand Alliance was formed and the man who almost had the idea before any of them wiped out. Very interesting. Um, he was a man of deep culture. 
it's not insignificant that when the great Russian painter Malevich, <coughs> frightened to go back to Russia, wanted to know where he could leave a very substantial group of his paintings, he put them in the care of Hugo Herring. So enough said, perhaps, on that front. He, it is a phenomenon, and it does make you ask yourself what it was all about and what was that theory all about, and so on. Can I just have another two slides? I've, I've, I've always been a bit surprised, Peter, that you spent so much ammunition <laughs> shooting at me on, on Herring's behalf. Why you never had a go at this? <laughs> Farm by well, you haven't, you know. I mean, sure as hell, there's foot and mouth disease coming out of that <laughs> that one there. Look at all the trucks ready to take it all over the place. Um, and, and I think also, I, I mean, I, I adore Corbu, but I equally I can't help shooting at him too because um, <laughs> he did so many things that were terribly wrong, although he was the greatest. But the sort of images of these French peasants in clogs clumping up and down this metallic <laughs> staircase of this prefab, all frankly tidy, um, is, is extremely interesting because, of course, the word rational starts coming into it. And, and of course, the Corbus' favorite adjective was Cartesian. And what Descartes meant by rational was that which is measurable. And awkward characters like Herring come along and say the things that really matter in life are not <laughs> measurable. Um, so th let's, let's try and tackle a little bit of the theory. Oh, oh, the only other thing I want to say on the sort of historical front is that um, The way in which a generation of German architects at the turn of the century pounced on English 19th century theory, what we call the free school, is extremely important. And so you get the famous Mutesius Das Englische Haus. And it, by my own heartfelt theory that, and I set it out in the book which NASA waved just now, the other tradition, is that wh whatever was of any originality in the thesis proposed by the modern movement actually was started in this country in the 1840s and 1850s with people like William Morris, um, Ruskin, uh, Patrick mentioned Leatherby, a whole school of thought that was trying to deal with a complete shift in the kinds of purposes that architecture had to serve. Projects of great complexity, projects of great public complexity, uh, hospitals, railway stations, schools, museums, uh, libraries and so on, the sort of things that weren't really in the brief for the earlier generation, um, sort of Ren and Hawksmoor, and the need, therefore, to find some approach, some philosophical approach to discovering what you ought to be doing in the first instance before you get down to doing all those drawings and so on. And um, so that in one sense, I see uh, Herring as epitomizing and actually doing in many ways more sort of eloquently what had started in this country, an attempt to articulate that aspect of the theory of modern movement that then became sort of damned with the wretched word functionalism. 
And it's terribly important to take that word apart again and try to understand it a little bit more. Um, the, the sort of the one sentence that I'm taking from Hugo Herring is the one where he says, we want to examine things and allow them to discover their own images. It goes against the grain with us to bestow a form on them from the outside. It's a very, very difficult statement, but it is absolutely the hub of a, an argument which has you taking as your point of departure in any architectural uh, exercise completely differently from the point of departure of those whose hang-up is on technology or those whose hang-up is on aesthetics. The invention of aesthetics in the 18th century was a disaster because it happened just at the moment when the first schools of architecture were being set up, the Ecole Royale in Paris and then becoming the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, just at that very moment, um, Kant defined the beautiful as the useless. <coughs> the phrase used was purposefulness without purpose. And in saying that, he fundamentally contradicted the classical and medieval category of architecture as one of the practical arts. Aristotle made a distinction between the pure arts which serve only themselves, and the fine arts which serve only themselves, one thinks of music and mathematics and so on, and the practical arts that serve an end other than themselves and are still an art. And don't forget, the Greeks did not have a muse for architecture. It was considered to be an everyday activity, banosos. It was not anything to do with that which was so refined that the definition of it had to be that it was useless. And of course, in the, um, in the Echo <coughs> de Beaux-Arts, uh, they went even further still. I um, can't remember the guy's name, but the, the guy who wrote about the sublime, Burke, uh, taken over into the, as it were, the regime of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Not only was the project to be useless, it was to challenge reason. It was to be sublimely above reason. Now, actually, in fairness to Kant, he pretty quickly said, this cannot possibly be true for architecture. <laughs> but by that time, the cat was out of the bag, and the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was born. Mm -hmm. And from that point onwards, we get a division, a tragic division, between form and purpose, between the beautiful and the useful. The Greeks never had such a division. They had one word for the two things t together. And it's interesting that you find people like Leatherby, um, or, and, and you, you, f you find in another typical character of this period, Bruno Taut, saying that the beautiful and the useful are absolutely inseparable. The, beautiful and elegant performance of purpose. Uh, constant references, of course, to, to yachts and so on. Um, and what, what began to happen was that, particularly in Germany, there was a sort of a class distinction entered into the common parlance, which Herring himself, I think, was guilty of, in a way, because it doesn't clarify the issue clearly. Um, on, on the one hand, you have something called architecture, which was posh, and on the other hand, you have something called building, which was to do with the everyday. And this class distinction was uh, paralleled by the aesthetic movement of the 90s, 
distinction between sort of art and life. The famous statement of the poet, um, can't remember his name now, but living, our servants will do that for us. So all of a sudden, we get some inexcusable distinction between life as something which is banal, utilitarian, and boring, and art, the real thing, which is purposeless and above the level of all of that. Um, Herring was one of the people who found this, in, and, and I think quite articulately, in, in a way, as, as totally um, un unacceptable. And it was into this false debate, if you like, that he enters on the side of life. And he was trying to put forward a, a formulation in, in which he used analogies with the organic to what he called the task of developing the architectural organism through a study of function. Um, it, it was his thesis, and it was the one that I would like to impress on you now, is that unless a work of architecture springs from the sense of purpose, and from that point moves out, moves on to technology, to form, to articulateness, to symbolism, or what, whatever, it, it is dead from the start. And you have, in a sense, to have a whole slightly different terminology, a slightly different focus in, in order to explore that language that, that Sharoon was um, after. I, I can see absolutely no reason at all why you have to have a class distinction once you get into the frame of mind which says this thing has to be purposeful. I see no reason a, at all why you could ever make a class distinction even if you start at one end with a garden shed and the other end you let end with a cathedral. It is a seamless garment between and where on earth do you suddenly say that's architecture and that's mere building? Because purpose, and Peter touched on this th th this morning, isn't, isn't a simple thing. It's not just an ergonomic, uh, something that can just be described sort of ergonomically. It is to do with the way of life, an another herring word, that is supposed to be served by the building. And that can be at one end deeply, uh, uh, the level of sim symbolism might be weighted heavily at one end and almost irrelevant at the other end. But that doesn't mean to say that it isn't part of one whole family of activities and values in which the element of propriety tells you where the balance is. I mean, clearly, if you are doing a bridge that's spanning an enormous di distance, propriety will make the technology, the prime element in it, and you'll have a, have a catenary of some form because that's, that's the only way you could span th th those things. But once you come back down into the range of sort of human activities and living and so on, it's a very, very touchy business and symbolism comes into it too, and that is part of the purpose as well. But unless it starts with an attempt to understand the life form of the building, um, it's no good. Now, um, can, can I have a couple more slides? I'm trying to remember what I did with the slides. Uh, <clears throat> next one, next slides. Oh yes. Um, what, what, once you use phrases like we want to examine things and allow them to discover their own images, um, you are, of course, in trouble, but 
in trouble because how do you proceed on from, from that? I, I had the alarming experience of the very, very first students that I ever taught when I went to Cambridge in 1956 was Chris Alexander. And uh, there's never been a case where a teacher was made to feel so small by a student. Um, because Chris Alexander has, has worried away at this particular issue and, and I had to try and su su support his application for fellowship at Trinity and read that damn book of his, um, um, uh, in which he was trying to resolve this issue of what do they want, as if it was a problem-solving structure that had a mathematical structure to do it with clumping and so on. The problem with that is that you, you're always going to leave out the vital thing, which he certainly did in his studies out in India. <laughs> he, he forgot the importance of the cow or something like that, and the whole argument fell apart. Um, it's not going to be done in some kind of simplistic, almost Cartesian analytical way. <coughs> what, what I've, I've put up a couple of images here which, to my mind, symbolize what we patronizingly call primitive um, societies building their culture. They're actually extremely sophisticated. The forms which are arrived at are intensely to do with a certain way of life and values. And again, that's the kind of stuff Peter was talking about the other day. Uh, th they may look fairly formal, as they do on the right. They may look quite casual and randomized, as they do on the left. But either way, they are highly structured in terms of what people want. And furthermore, in this particular case, actually made by the people themselves, literally by hand, um, Mum, dad, and granny, and all were actually making the things and adapting them and changing them and adding to them bit by bit and so on. And, and an intensely one to one relationship between what people wanted and what they got. Now, if you switch to our situation where you come on the scene as a professional acting with some mysterious knowledge for other people who you probably can't even get to talk to, then you're in a very dangerous situation. And um, you know, you get people like Philip Johnson saying, whatever you do, don't talk to the client. And of course, the sort of joke case of Lutchins where the lady who wanted to have a house came to see him and he said to her, do you have any idea of, any, of the sort of thing you want? And she said, yes. And he said, well, you might as well leave the room now. Um, and the whole issue which, which, which has, has become highly focused in the last 15 years or so is the business of how you do get some kind of debate going with the people whose building you are building. I, I think preeminently the person who's, uh, uh, I mean, exemplary person in this case is Giancarlo De Carlo. Um, um, and, and you probably sort of know all about that, but he is someone who has very, very gently and frontally attacked the issue of actually talking to people, talking them through models, taking their views, revising the thing, and so on, in a, in a quite exemplary way. And in miniature, that, that is, of course, what we all ought to be, ought, ought to be doing. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to take, as a work to, I'm, I'm, uh, Actually, I'm, I'm going to take an example from the work of Sharoon uh, for the simple reason, to sort of cheat, because 
He's given us all the answers to the questions, and so I can use it as an exemplary case without just simply guessing. Um, he was very, very close to Herring, as you all know, through Peter's books. Um, in, enormously energetic in his productivity and so on. And um, actually, before I get to the case I'm going to do, I'm, I've just got the next two slides. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the most obvious and familiar one, the one that's familiar to you all, as a built structure that you can go into and see, is the Philharmonie, in which uh, you might say Sh Sharoon asked, asked music what it wanted to be, and music wanted to be in the center, and the sketches on the left here um, show a completely new and profound reinterpretation of the performance of music over against what we had all always been told, which is that the ideal form is the Viennese shoebox. He looked at it again and he always, in terms of people with a clear sociological um, sensibility, um, had the idea of the music in the center and people grouped around it. Um, and not just simply in a rather dumb circle around <coughs> it, but in discrete groups, as it were, little groups or sort of societies of people. Um, breaking the scale of the thing down to human body language and scale. Again, the complete opposite of the Viennese shoebox that had all the knobs and white tying tails up front and the yobs at the back. Equally, equal distribution and availability of enjoyment of the music all round. And that idea of this bowl with the wonderful counterform of the space underneath the bowl for the circulations um, in order to bring people up at umpteen different points around the edges here to get into their own local group of seats. So you see, the whole thing is being thought of in terms of people's experience of the building. It's not being thought of formalistically, not being thought of technologically, not being thought of aesthetically. It is not indulging in golden sections and all that kind of thing. It's trying to understand, uh, almost in a kind of <coughs> Proustian level of sensibility, what, what the life of that performance will be and so on. And, um, you only have to listen to uh, to Mala <laughs> in that you kind of levitate, the whole audience is levitating. And then when you break off to have a drink and the bell goes, there are most amazing scenes, rather like um, the, those sort of cartery et etchings of uh, what's his name, with people moving around, almost ballet, you, you almost become part of the ballet in the interval of finding your way back to your seat. You are engaged, totally in it. Can I have the next t two slides? I'm, I'm just sort of trying to build up now uh, a, a sort of a terminology that, that, that needs to be drawn out of Herring's priorities, which is utterly different from the way architect taught me. Well, here, here we have the groups of people around. And Again, because continually you have to say what it is not, uh, almost at the moment when you say what it is, it is not expressionism. We'll, we'll get to that later. The freedom of form that Sharoon's generation developed in a rather crazy post-war expressionist phase, people like, like him, and I think preeminently um, 
um, alto later, turned into a supple vehicle for doing purposeful things, not just expressionist, look mama no hands things. And uh, an, an analysis of the acoustics of this, of which is a, a half of the plan, shows that these planes, which actually define the individual groups that I've talked about, work beautifully in terms of uh, resonance and so on. So we're talking about the uh, performance of, of purpose, purposefulness becoming poetic. <coughs> and so that those who think that performance and function is one of those banal things, mere function, um, have to think again. Now, I, I, I've started with this because this is a building which I, I imagine that you all know and that you've been into, so you can actually experience the sort of vibes of it. But the example that I'm going to pursue in some detail, um, can I have the next slides, please, is um, a, a set piece that unfortunately was not built, but which Sharoon himself devised when he was asked to take part um, in a sy symposium in Darmstadt in 1951, in an, an, an amazing symposium, uh, which had people like Rudolf Schwarz, the great German church architect, um, and Otto Bartning, um, Eiermann, who, who must have felt a bit odd in that company, I guess, um, and the philosophers Ortega y Gasset from, from Spain and, damn it, Martin Heidegger. <coughs> uh, Heidegger gave his famous paper there um, on, you know, what it was, dwelling, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm continually sparring with Peter on this fact that I, I, I think he doesn't give enough credit to Heidegger. Um, Sharoon admits influence of uh, Heidegger and um, I think the values that are associated, um, Patrick used the word existential this morning, um, takes you much nearer to the language that, that we need, uh, certainly, than the language of the Beaux-Arts. Um, okay, now, what he took was a school. And first of all, I want to name the parts, as they say, and, and I want to take it easy now. So we're slowly going to work our way up this, okay? We come in here, and we've got a kind of admin um, and the caretaker's flat here. Um, then we have the assembly, okay? Well, the first thing that you have to notice, and I have to mention it first, is that there's a pathway going through here. There's a, there's a sort of medieval analogy, and Peter has r referred to the difference between a corridor and a pathway, a pathway that swells open here and there for people to stop and chat or look out into a courtyard or keep going. Um, then we have the library, and then there's a little courtyard here, and we have the arts and crafts rooms here. This is a primary school. Um, there's a chapel here. This is what Sh Sharoon called the meeting cloister, the sort of village center. I don't want to miss any of these. I'm taking it a bit slow. I think we've dealt with the ge generally shared elements at the beginning here. And then as we, as we move up through this path, um, we come across what he calls gateways, one here, one there, and another one here. And these are given a certain formal symbolic significance as the entry point 
for each of the three age groups. So that the kids that are the youngest, whether they are six to nine or something, coming through their little gateway here and the shared facilities for that age group then break down into the classrooms here. And there's, in the first place, there's a question of orientation. The youngest kids are facing south. They have a, a kind of sun-bathed patio and a shared sun-filled area for running around in. And the shape of the space that they are in has a certain a, s a certain structuring here, but he's then very, very free after that. And Sharoon goes on about the use of colour and the shapes that are appropriate to that particular age group, and he makes an analogy with the idea of a nest. Okay, we move on to the next group, um, wh wh whatever they are, sort of 9 to, to, to 12 or something. And here, going in through their gateway into their shared facilities, we get completely different form. We get an absolute square. Uh, th this is so oriented that two groups of three classrooms have a courtyard which is open to the changes of the sun during the day east and west. A form that is fairly strictly defined, very strictly defined, and we get Sharoon's notion of the beginning of some kind of discipline and self-consciousness rather than the envelopment and so on of the young kid. Uh, then we go on to the third group here, and here the orientation is due north, which means, amongst other things, of course, that they're looking at a sunlit landscape, uh, but themselves are in a kind of cool, cool uh, base, which itself leads through to what he calls the parliament, where they get together and discuss things. And you have to imagine where in 1951 the urgent need in Germany to be reinforcing the idea that people make up their own minds about things and don't have them dictated to them. And the notion that the school kids would have a say in the running of the school must have been incredibly revolutionary at that moment. And here they have that little sort of parliament for that. Um, we went past the gymnasium here, which leads out both ways into playing fields. And then there's a thing called, a, is it the planetarium or something? The cosmic room. The cosmic room, I beg your pardon, um, in which the kids are made aware of the biggest scale of the cosmos, the stars and so on. Um, and there's a little stream running through here. And that is the model. Um, I could almost have put this alongside one of those so-called primitive villages that we saw at the beginning, the sort of scale, the articulation, the individual identity of each element having its own <coughs> character, as Ruskin would say, <laughs> Uh, breaking the scale down to the scale of children, physically, dimensionally, articulate identity for the age groups through the form and the orientation. Um, so what, what we've got here, um, I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, And the slide on the right. Okay, and this one too. Oh, I'm, I beg your pardon. <laughs> there it is. All right. So th this is taking apart analytically. The these diagrams show those groups of what Sharon calls the schoolhoods, and then here the quality 
thinning, thickening, directionality, broadening out, loosening, stopping, moving, and so on, of the pathway through. Can I have the next slide on the right? These diagrams actually don't tell you a great deal more than I have already mentioned to you in relation to the youngest group here. Here's the gateway, here's the wet services and loos and hanging coats and kicking each other and all that kind of stuff before class going in here of the youngest group. Can I have the next slide on the right? And then this is the group whose entrance here, gateway, <coughs> shared space of the, the identity of that age group and then into their classrooms and their cool courtyard. And the next on the right, and then these are the senior kids with their spaces and the parliament here. Um, I think I go one more slide on the right and one more slide on the left. This is a sort of bird's eye view drawing of the whole thing. I don't know if there's anything about this that Peter wants to say because I've stolen this image from his book. Maybe it doesn't um, need anything. Something, hmm? that, something that you, you might not know is the stream. Uh, well, I did say it just now. The stream, um, it, exists, it goes into a lake. Uh, exists and is exactly like that. Yes. It's, it's the, the, the intended site is still there. Yes. So well, actually, that, that, of course, is important because, um, as you said, Sharoon knew that he had to give a lecture in Darmstadt, and so he said, why don't we just invent a working example of what they ought to do in Darmstadt? Uh, and, and, and it's a real sight. Yeah. Um, 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 next on the left, I think. Next on the right. Uh, well, all right, okay, hold on a minute. Um, the, the other, other thing, uh, his studies then, which I won't go into because I'm not really familiar enough with it, but typically, um, sense of place and all the rest of it, he did not do, which is what Corbu always would do, which is an abstraction, a Cartesian abstraction of things. There had to be a particular place, and the genius loci leading through to this lake had the wider ramification of the surrounding things. Uh, I think what we've got here, the sort of schloss, and here we've got the state church, and here I think yeah, is, this the, is a man. That's the Matildan here, you know, the Albrecht. Yes, group. yes, oh, yes. The and this. That's the church. Yeah, I beg your pardon, I've got them the, the wrong way around, yes. Um, as perceived from the school here as kind of local orienting uh, <coughs> presences. Um, I think I probably want the next slide on the right now, if I haven't completely confused myself. Yes, I thought it was quite interesting, again, symbolic. You see, this is a Paul Clay, and it's, the title of it is Fluctuating Balance, or something like that, like, like that. And immediately, the difference between Corbu's thinking and Sharoon's come up in the same way that the thinking of Picasso and Cubism is very, very different from Paul Clay. Paul Clay is thinking on the wavelength that, that I'm trying to think of at the moment in terms of um, processes, organic shifts, interrelations, subtle emphasis pressures and so on. And the sort of imagery of that, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I put it alongside it because it's almost a sort of a pun, it's almost too good to be true. Um, but it, it helps to make the point that I'm trying to make, which is to get onto a wavelength that is very, very different from normal architectural discourse. Next on the left, I think I must very nearly be done. Oh yes, and, now, and the next on the right. 
just one, one final example of this kind of thinking. Um, there was a competition for office in Mal, and 1950-ish, and scheme after scheme were doing the so-called rational thing, uh, the Mission box. Um, how on earth the word rational got applied to that kind of thing, I don't know. It's rational in terms of productivity, yes, because you can belt out the reproduced parts more quickly than doing it another way. If, if that's your idea of rationalism, that's what it is. Now, n the next two slides, what, what, what I find absolutely fascinating as a, as a final thought is that two architects who cannot conceivably have discussed the matter of the town hall t together produced projects which are at the opposite pole from those boxes, Sharon and Alto. Um, what did they do? Both of them broke this public authority down into smaller identifiable parts with different activities, significances, form and so on. Interestingly, both of them produce a sort of fan shape, a, a kind of hand shape form. And all, all I infer from that is that on that site, you could almost say that for people who approach the problem in the way that I'm trying to articulate now, there's something very much like the right solution. I'm on dangerous ground here. The right solution to that problem lies in an anatomy of this kind for people who are really taking this project seriously, trying to understand what it is, trying to understand how people who have to flock into it would understand it and find their way around and have some identity to it. Um, and I think on the comparison between those images, I rest my case. Okay? Thanks. Thank you very much, Sam. Couldn't agree with you more on the issue of the beautiful and the useful. I think that's a very important issue that we could hopefully discuss a bit later on. <laughs>